we're living in very exciting times. We are living in very exciting times because they herald the very near return of our Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. And these are very exciting times because we are living at the end of an age. We are living at the end of an epoch in history. The next epoch in history, friends, will be one of only two epochs that has ever seen the Lord Jesus Christ step foot on this earth. And you know, at the end of every major epoch throughout history, there were uh, distinct signs and conditions that prevailed at the end of that age. Just come with me to Genesis chapter 6 for a moment. We're looking at a time period in history that ended in the, uh, when, when the earth was flooded in the times of Noah. And we see in Genesis chapter 6, we see there in verse 5 it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That was the state of mind, ladies and gentlemen, of the people in the earth at that time. You have a look at verse 11. The earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. They were the conditions that prevailed at the end of this age. And God wiped out the whole population of the earth at that time, save for eight, eight souls. Eight people, that's it. And that is exactly where we are at this point in time, ladies and gentlemen. We are at the end of an age, an end of an epoch. And tonight we wish to have a look at some of the signs that are prevailing in our, in our day. Precisely, they're evil and they're violent. Okay, so the outline for tonight, we wish to have a look at the signs within our communities. There's social upheaval. There's a decline in moral standards. We want to have a look at the signs within the political world. The social unrest, the Arab uprisings that we had a couple of years ago. The unrest that we're currently seeing in Greece. Democracies being installed in various places around the world where dictatorships have been taken down with disastrous results. We see signs in the religious world. Religious wars, religious tolerance declining. We see signs in the military world with military spending on the increase. We see signs within the Bible itself and we wish to have a look at some Bible prophecy. So let's have a look firstly at the signs within our community. We have social upheaval at very high levels. We have the breakdown in the family unit. We're going to have a look at divorce rates and domestic violence rates. We've got this issue of marriage equality, which is just eating out our community. And then we're going to have a look at lifestyle disease. So first of all, the, the breakdown of the family unit. You know, half of all marriages today end up in divorce. A quarter of all the children in the United States of America are living in single parent families. I don't have the stats for Australia, I couldn't find them. You know, back in the 1940s, not all that long ago, it's less than a hundred years, parents had lots of children. They had up to eight children in a family. Quite often in a, in a house that's a three by one with a toilet out the back. Four kids in each room. Today, kids have lots of parents. They have mum, they have dad, stepmum, stepdad, and the latest stepmum. And some of them are unfortunate enough to be in a family with parents in single sex relationships. Let's just make it clear, ladies and gentlemen, God does not tolerate homosexuality or lesbianism. It's an abomination to him. It's wickedness to him. Just cast your mind back to Genesis chapter 6, verse 11. It is a movement that is slowly, 
but surely overtaking the world. But what's God's ideal? Come back a couple of pages, Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, and we read there in verse 24, it says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That's God's ideal. In fact, it's not an ideal. That's God's guidelines. If you don't follow them, you'll run into trouble. It's a little more important than just an ideal. And the word cleave there, ladies and gentlemen, means, means to adhere to as if with glue. And when you glue something together, you don't intend it to come apart. It flies in the face of marriage and divorce. But notice what it says there. Or notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say, therefore shall a man leave his father and his father and cleave unto his husband. Homosexuality is an abomination to God. Domestic violence. Do you know that Australian police handle one domestic violence matter every two minutes somewhere in this country? Every two minutes. So far today, police in Australia will have dealt with on average 602 domestic violence cases. And when you read that article, it's on the ABC News website about two months ago, when you read that article, it was the majority of their business. Something like 70% of their work was dealing with domestic violence cases. That's a lot. Come with me to Colossians chapter 3. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we're told how to run our families and our lives according to God's way. And if followed, there should be no domestic violence. Colossians chapter 3, and we read there in verse 17, and it says, Whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. That should wipe domestic violence out, if followed. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleases, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men. So how does domestic violence happen if families are built on God's ideals and God's guidelines? It happens because they are not following his guidelines. And secondly, it's a lack of knowledge of the word of God. Because they have shut their ears. They're not interested in the word of God. They're not interested in God himself. We'll see that a little bit later on. We have a decline in moral standards. As we mentioned briefly earlier, as a lack of morals, we wind up with same-sex relationships, which is a wickedness before God. If you turn with me just a few pages to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says, This know also that in the last days, that is the end of an age, that's now, perilous times shall come. 
For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce bakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. There it is. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. That's how we wind up with that wickedness. But people are lovers of their own selves. People are lovers of money. Have you heard the saying, money is the root of all evil? Well, it's a misquote of a quote in the Bible. Just come back a couple of pages to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and at verse 10. It says, for the love of money is the root of of all evil. You notice what they've missed out? They've missed out the words, the love. It's not money that is the root of all evil, because money of itself is no problem. Father uh, Abraham, the father of Israel, was a very wealthy man. But it is the love of money that is the root of all evil. And many have left the truth because of it. We go on. They are proud. They are arrogant. They are abusive. You just go out onto the roads and annoy somebody and see what happens. You're lucky if you don't receive a bullet. Road rage is on the increase. They're on edge. They're abusive. They're ungrateful. They're without self-control. You can think of the road rage again. Heartless, unappeasable. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And so there is this general decline in morals. Let's just have a look at signs within the political world. We have social unrest. And we can think of the demonstrations in Greece over their debt crisis. You know, There's a German newspaper that had across it no more billions for the greedy Greeks. The Germans aren't happy bailing the Greeks out. And it's not an unbaseless claim that they make. You know, Greeks were retiring in their 40s. Wouldn't that be nice? And when they retire, their pension was generally around about 96% of their salary. Why would you work? Why would you work? Greek hairdressers, infamously qualified for retirement at the age of 50. And you know why? It was due to the rigour of their work. They were known for it. Such was the corruption that was going on in that country. Deaths weren't being reported to the government so that the handouts could be collected for grandma and grandpa and great grandma and great grandpa. Just a little more cash on the side. They claimed it for years. It's only recently that they've abolished some of these generous generous measures so that they could get loans in return to help bail them out. How did these things creep in? Well, these generous handouts were included in pensions and so forth so that they were popular at election time and they could get into government. We were just talking about the love of money is the root of all evil. We had the Arab uprisings just a couple of years ago where people were uprising against their governments because they weren't happy. 
You had democracy being installed in place of existing dictatorships because democracy was the way to go, as so they, so they thought. We have the ISIS cult and all their atrocities that are occurring throughout the earth. Let's just come back to Jeremiah chapter 10 on the overhead there. In Jeremiah chapter 10, we're given the reason why this is all falling over. In Jeremiah chapter 10, and we read in verse 23, it says, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself, it is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Man is unable to direct his ways. He's unable to direct his own ways, let alone than, than that of his fellows. And this is why we run into problems. We have all these minority groups fighting for their own self-interests, generally at the expense of the majority. And so we wind up in these problems that we have. Now we come to signs within the religious world. And the fact is, ladies and gentlemen, most people just don't want to know. 2 Timothy chapter 4, we read there in verse 3 of why that is the case. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, we read there in verse 3, it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust, they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So people simply do not want to know what is in this book. It teaches them how to run a family. It teaches them how to act before their God. It teaches them how to act in everyday life and they don't want to hear it. And so the ideals of God are replaced with the ideals of man. And they're using religious wars to justify their position. They don't want to know about religion. All that does is causes wars throughout the world. You've got Shiites versus Sunnis. You've got the Jews versus the Palestinians. And so on and so forth. Well, let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. If they were true religions, there wouldn't be war. Why are there so many religions? There's only one God. Why are there so many religions? But we don't have time to go into that tonight. But the fact is, they don't believe what's in this book. That's the basis. And so, in reality, what they are doing is they're blaming God for the violence that is being generated in the earth. There is a mocking and blasphemy of God's words. Just come to 2 Peter chapter 3. Second of Peter, chapter 3, we read there in verse 3, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. They're making a complete mockery of the word of God. Because there is a promise, ladies and gentlemen, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ will return to the earth and it's going to happen very soon. And these people didn't believe it. And so there's these signs within the religious world that the Lord Jesus Christ is just around the corner. Because when he returns to this earth, ladies and gentlemen, 
everybody will know who he is and everybody will know who God is. When we come to the military world, there's some interesting signs in that too. Just recently you will have heard in the news that China's rise to power and their incursions into the South China Sea. The US has moved some of their assets into the South Pacific in response to this move. We only have to look at Japan, who has also moved as a result of China. They've moved to allow preemptive strikes because in World War II they adopted a, pass a pacifist constitution where they would not <coughs> cast the first blow. Well, now they want to change that. They have cited doing this so that they can um, ping missiles at North Korea. But just in the background, oh, yeah, we're also worried about China as well. Military spending on the increase. Australia has just committed $60 billion on new warships, so the South Australians have got something to do. Okay? This military spending is being increased. And we're just about to go and buy more submarines from other countries around the world. We don't know which one it's going to be yet. We also have Russia flexing her military might. And that's interesting, ladies and gentlemen, as we'll see a little bit later on. But let's just have a look at the spending that is going on. The, mil the uh, military spending for the US is spending something like $640 billion on military spending. You might notice China is next, but have a look at Russia. They're third in line. They're getting ready for something. But it's not until you have a look at the figures properly you really see what they're up to. The, the US is, is spending 3.8% of their GDP. Russia might be third, but they're spending 9.3% of their GDP. And so they are preparing to get themselves ready for war. And so we come to Bible prophecy, the signs that exist within the Bible itself. I want to have a look at um, a Bible prophecy that's been fulfilled in that the, the prophecy of the dispersion of the Jews. I want to have a look at some partially fulfilled prophecies. And then I want to have a look at prophecies that are to be fulfilled. And then we'll have a look at how the prophecies will impact on us. Turn with me to Deuteronomy for a moment. Thank you. Deuteronomy 28, 64. And Yahweh shall scatter thee from all people, from one end of the earth, even to the other and there thou shalt serve other gods which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations thou shalt find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But Yahweh shall give thee a trembling heart and failing of eyes and sorrow of, my, of mind. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee. And that prophecy, ladies and gentlemen, came uh, to fruition. They were scattered right throughout the world on a number of occasions and most notably um, they were persecuted especially during World War II. But if we come and have a look at a partially fulfilled prophecy we are told that the nation of Israel would be gathered together and re-enter the land. In fact a leading rabbi in Israel is urging Jews to make <coughs> Aliyah as soon as possible. And Aliyah is basically immigration back to the land of Israel. And the leading rabbi has asked people to make Aliyah as the return of the Messiah is imminent. Ezekiel chapter 37, if you come over there for a moment, Ezekiel chapter 37. He's, 
God says in verse 21, And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be scattered, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, that prophecy has begun to take place. The Jews have started to immigrate back to the land of Israel. It has started to take place. Come over with me to Jeremiah chapter 32. And we read there in verse 37. He says, Behold, I will gather them from out of all countries, whither I have driven them in mine anger, and in my fury, and in great wrath, and I will bring them again unto this place, and I will cause them to dwell safely. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And so these are prophecies, ladies and gentlemen, that are starting to come to pass before our very eyes. Just come back to Ezekiel once more and we'll have a look at chapter 21. This is an example of a, of a, of a prophecy, ladies and gentlemen, that has multiple applications. Ezekiel chapter 21, we read there in verse uh, 27. Or, or we'll have a look at... Um, Verse 25, it says, And thou profane, wicked prince of Israel, <coughs> whose day is come, when iniquity shall have an end, thus saith the Lord God, Remove the diadem, take off the crown. This shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low, and abase him that is high. I will overturn, overturn, <coughs> overturn it. Excuse me, and it shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it him. <coughs> and that is a prophecy, ladies and gentlemen, that is speaking of the nation of Israel being overturned three times. And the first time that it was overturned, you can see on the overhead there, is when it was invaded by Babylon. And they were carted away off into captivity, roughly about BC 600. And then the next time they were overturned is when they uh, were, were taken siege in AD 70 and the Romans came through and obliterated them once more. And there's a third overturning. And that third overturning, we believe, ladies and gentlemen, will be conducted by Russia. All those three nations were all powers to the north of Israel. And when God brought judgment down upon the nation of Israel for their wickedness, it was always from the north. And we believe that that is going to be um, Russia herself. Come with me to Ezekiel chapter 38 for a moment. We believe it's going to be Russia. Because in Ezekiel chapter 38, it tells us what is going to happen. We read there in verse 14, it says, Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, that is, Russia, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou not know it? And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. And it shall be in the latter days, <coughs> and I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me when I shall <coughs> be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. And so we believe in the not too distant future that Russia is going to come down and take the nation of Israel for a third time. Have a look at Zechariah chapter 14 for a moment. In Zechariah chapter 14, 
We read there in verse 1, it says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. And I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And so in the not too distant future, God is going to bring all nations to Jerusalem to battle the battle of Armageddon. But if you come over to Luke chapter 21 for a moment. See, at the moment, all these nations are being prepared for battle. And we can see these things happening in the military spending that is going on. And the general persona of the people within the political world. People being angry. People wanting to be at war with one another. We read there in verse 25 of Luke chapter 21, it says, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars, and upon the earth distre <coughs> distress of nations with perplexity, the waves, <coughs> the sea and the waves roaring. And so when we have a look at this chapter, you can see up there on the, on the overhead that the sun and moon and stars is talking about the political and civil nations uh, and civil powers. The distress of nations in that verse signifies there's just no way out. They don't know what to do. They don't know whether they're coming or going. They don't know whether the globe's warming or whether it's cooling. There's a big debate going on about that. Men are fearful for the future things to come upon the earth. It says in verse 26, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken and they shall see the Son of Man and then they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, lift up your heads. For your redemption draweth nigh. The Lord Jesus Christ will return. It's going to happen very shortly. And he is going to give uh, eternal life to all of those who have served and obeyed God. But there's a question. Are you worried about the things that are coming to pass in the earth at this present time? Do you feel insecure? Are we free from the threat of terrorism? Terrorism aside, what about job security? Will conditions in, in the earth be different once all of this commotion has happened? Well, the answer is absolutely. The kingdom of God is going to be set up upon earth. In, in Daniel chapter 2 and at verse 44 it says, In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. It's going to be a glorious time, ladies and gentlemen. It's a time when everybody will feel safe. There will be no need for a police force. It will be a time when every man shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree. There will be no need for food security. It will be there in abundance. The poor will be looked after. There won't be the millions of people who are starving in the earth at the current time. It will be a time when there will be peace, not only amongst people but also amongst the animal kingdom and the lamb will lay down with the lion. It will be a time of peace and prosperity and righteousness. Are you ready? Do you want to be a part of this glorious future? God has opened up an invitation to every person on this globe. Everyone is welcome who does not close their ears to the word. But we must play our part. And what part is that? Well, there are three steps to a valid baptism. Our part, ladies and gentlemen, 
is to come to a knowledge of the Word of God. When we have done that, we will see the necessity to be baptised into the all-saving name of the Lord Jesus Christ and have our sins washed away. We will then recognise the need to continually follow the commandments that God has set down in his word. And that will cause us to live a life in accordance with his commandments. And when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to this earth, if we have been found to be faithful, we will be granted eternal life and we will be able to live in that glorious future, soon to dawn upon the face of the earth. And you might remember, ladies and gentlemen, when we first started this lecture, we were talking about epochs and we're at the end of an epoch. Well, those epochs all finished suddenly. When we're talking about the first epoch and we're talking about Noah and the ark, when those eight people walked into the ark and the door was shut, that was it. Game over. When the, when the Romans came and besieged Jerusalem in AD 70, that was it. It changed overnight. And ladies and gentlemen, come with me to Revelation chapter 22. Because this epoch is going to end just as suddenly. But up until that point, everything is going to carry on just as normal. And that's the trap. Revelation chapter 22, and we read there in verse 12, it says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Ladies and gentlemen, our time is running out. This epoch is going to end suddenly, and we urge you to take the opportunity now while you yet have time to take a hold of this book to come to a knowledge of God and his plan and purpose with the earth and with mankind upon it and to fulfil our obligation to be baptised in the all saving name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you might have the opportunity to spend your uh, eternal life in that glorious future